Well, well, well. Good afternoon, church family. Notice the emphasis on family. We're all connected. Some may feel not as connected as they should be, but we are all connected. And uh, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for inviting me, the church leadership team, facilitated by pastor. Isn't pastor a good pastor? I, I, I genuinely mean this. I couldn't do my job. I'm the first elder at Hope Community. I couldn't do my job without pastor's support. And I know that I am not the only person he is playing a supportive role too. So having thanked you for inviting me, I bring greetings from Hope Community. As our name suggests, we try to intentionally interact with our immediate community. I don't know whether you do that here. Maybe you live at a distance and you just come in, enjoy worship and go. But I was out the other day, uh, just ahead of our annual barbecue. What did I say? Okay, All right. People relate to food, free food. That's the reality. We've got to find ways of engaging. And I knocked at some doors, and I said, I'm from around the corner. They said, we know. And I said, you know, we're having a barbecue. You are more than welcome to attend. In fairness, some people said, don't darken my doorway again. And that's allowed. We fought two world wars so that people could express themselves. But thankfully, there were others who said, we enjoy the singing. We're not as mobile as we used to be. And when we hear the songs, it reminds us of when we used to go to church. Keep on doing what you're doing. Amen. So that's Hope Community. And I'm rushing back there this evening. We're having a Sabbath sing-along part two. And that's just music and testimonies. Well, what a wonderful way to just say goodbye to the Sabbath and start the new week. Um, I want to manage your expectations. I'm not a minister, so you won't hear a sermon because I leave the preaching to the preachers. Amen. Amen. All right, we all have our areas of expertise. Um, I'm, I'm more of a, a teacher, so I expect my class to interact with me. Is that okay? If I see you sleeping, I will come down, touch you on the shoulder, and engage you. So you've got to stay with me. Is that, is that fair? All right? So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm loving this, um, primarily because this presentation was sparked by a conversation that I had with God. So I'm asking you to listen in on the conversation and respond if appropriate. Is that fair? All right. We won't be a long time because my understanding is that you finish at about two o'clock. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I want you to walk with me, and I should like you to use your sanctified imaginations as we review a well-known story captured in three of the Synoptic Gospels. And the mere fact that somebody says something three times in three different ways, it suggests to me that there's something there that's awfully important. And the Gospels were Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So it's obvious that God wants to make an impression. But I want you to understand that this story is somewhat different, similar, but different to the story whereby Jesus walks on water. Is that okay? I'm just trying to sort of set the tone here. The scriptural reading or focus comes to us from the book of Mark, Mark chapter 4. We're not going to zigzag all over the Bible today. I just want to be really focused so that when somebody asks you at work on Monday morning, how did you spend your weekend, you can preach my sermon to them. Amen. That's the purpose. Okay? 
Good afternoon to everybody online. We're reviewing Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. And Ainsley being Ainsley, I'm constantly looking for new ways to interpret what God is trying to say. So I've worked with a contemporary version, the amplified version, and I will read it in your hearing. By all means, following whatever version you will, but listen very carefully to what I'm saying. Is that okay? Is that okay? Thank you. I love energy, so give me energy. Is that good? All right, wonderful. On that same day, reading from verse 35 of Mark chapter 4, when evening had come, he, he being Jesus, said to them, let us go over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. I break, I pause. Has anybody been to the Sea of Galilee? So there's two people, three people, four people. Right? It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's somewhere you must go. It's affordable. Not just at the moment, for obvious reasons, right? But when things die down a little, right? Go to the Sea of Galilee. It is uh, an amazing place. Ask me why. Because it's a freshwater lake, although it's called a sea. Yeah, somebody kind of lost their way there, but it's a freshwater lake. All right, so... Verse 36, so leaving the crowd, they, that's the disciples and Jesus, took him just as he was in the boat, and the other boats were with him. So what we have here is not just one boat. It's a flotilla of boats. Do you see how we're just breaking it down? We're bringing it home. All right, so we have a situation where there's a flotilla of boats, and everybody is enjoying Verse 37, and a fierce windstorm began to blow, and waves were breaking over the boat so that it was already being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern. Where's a stern in a boat? Where's a stern in a boat? The back, yeah? And the front's called the? Look it up, homework. <laughs> Sounds like bow, right? Right, so Jesus was in the stern of the boat, And what was he doing? He was asleep with his head on the sailor's leather cushion. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are about to die? And he got up and sternly rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush! Be still! In the version I'm reading from, in the Amplified Version, it uses... An alliteration, and it compares the sea, that stormy sea, to a wild animal. And it says here in brackets, Jesus put a muzzle on that violent storm. And the wind died down. You know, sometimes you call to your kids, and it takes the third, the fourth attempt for them to register. Yeah? This is the master of the sea, talking to the sea. And the sea died down as if it had grown weary. And there was at once a great calm, a perfect peacefulness. Can the church say amen? Amen. And Jesus said to them, verse 40, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith and confidence in me? They were filled with great fear, and they said to each other, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I ask you, Lord, although you are present, to send your Holy Spirit in double measure today. Grant each of us, even me, greater understanding as you use me to communicate some key messages of hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I'm going to share something with you, and what is said in this room stays in this room. Chatham House rules, okay? Okay? 
Okay, right, okay. So, although I may seem super confident, all right, I do have some fears. Let me explain. To observe the grace and efficiency with which a natural-born swimmer performs in water is indeed a thing of great beauty. And I had to acknowledge uh, pretty early on in life that although God has gifted me with some things that I'm better at than most, swimming has never been, and probably never will be, one of them. Because I swim like lead. That's the truth. When I go to the public baths, and I'm off a certain age now where I pay less than everybody else. Amen. <laughs> Amen. When I go to the public baths, I go in at the shallow end, and I make sure I can feel the ground beneath me, and I pretend to swim. Can anybody relate to this? Okay, all right. Well, I'm in good company. All right. My thinking is, for those of you who are competent swimmers, it doesn't matter if you dust down that certificate on your wall which you have framed saying that you can swim 20 lengths, because if you're stuck in the middle of the ocean, it won't, really won't matter. Amen. All right, so, I don't feel too bad about it, but this is the reality. Swimming in a controlled environment like a swimming pool with a graduated floor designed so that there's a shallow end and a deep end is very different to swimming in a body of water. I'm talking about a lake. I'm talking about a sea. I'm talking about an ocean. Because quite simply put, when you find yourself in a natural body of water, you are not in control. Listen very carefully to what I'm saying. You are not in control. Has anybody here, and I need you to open up now, has anybody here almost drowned? Because had you drowned, you wouldn't be here. But has anybody here almost, almost drowned? I'm not talking about the sensation of drowning. It was, it was you know, you saw your lives or your one life flash before you. Shout at me, how did you feel? Scared? I can't hear you. Terrified? Panicked? Shocked? One more? Can't believe it's happening. There's a little lady over the back there. One more. Finished. Okay, all right. Okay, so, so. I would like to suggest to you that the fear of drowning in deep water, also known as phallosobia, for those of you who... You want me to say it again? Okay. Phal, I'll break it down. Phal, asophiba. All right? It's a phobia. All right? But the... Fear of drowning in deep water is so innate to most of us that everybody here, I would like to suggest, can relate to this story as found in Matthew chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. Interestingly, four of Jesus' disciples were professional fishermen. Do you know who they were? I'll help you. Simon Peter, also known as Peter. Any others? Any other? Uh, Andrew, James, and John. Well done. So, when it was suggested that after the exertions of a long, hard, hot day, that they should all leave the multitudes who they'd been servicing throughout the day and go over to the other side, their collective experience, if you've got professionals, if you've got experts amongst you, they're doing risk assessments all the time. Amen? Yes, they are. Their collective experience would have help them to appreciate that navigating that body of water was safe. It was safe to make the journey. Otherwise, they wouldn't have started on the journey, boarded that vessel in the first place. Are we all on the same page? Okay. 
After all, the sun was shining. The Sea of Galilee was sparkling beautifully. It was serene. It was warm, and the gentle breezes were so soporific. In other words, you kind of feel oozy, like when you're in a car or something like that, as a passenger, that is, yeah? That to all intents and purposes, it was not unreasonable that Jesus, who was exhausted, fell sound asleep. But this was the quiet before the storm, for suddenly, we read in verse 37, everything changed. That idyllic setting has become violent, has become angry. So much so that they fear for their lives and they make their way to where Jesus continues to sleep and they speak the words that we all feel when we're hurting, when the situation is out of control and worsening by the minute, when we're in pain, when we've had a bad prognosis, when your worst nightmares are becoming a harsh reality, when all that you've worked for appears to be lost, and when you're in absolute despair. Teacher, do you not care that we are about to die? Another version says, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And still another version of the Bible says, Teacher, don't you even care that we are about to drown? You know, on reading this, it reminded me of an event that didn't take place too long ago. Does anybody remember uh, the Bayesian super yacht back in August? Right? I mean, I'm, I'm did some reading around this. Built in 2008, and it was a luxury super yacht then. They ripped out everything and refurbished it in 2016. And the, um, the manufacturers made this very bold claim. It's unsinkable. And, and, you know, I suppose you do things which are larger than life when you've got a larger than life budget. That's life, isn't it? Help me here. Is it life? When you get your pay rise, do you save any more? No. You just assume a, a higher level of or standard of living. That's what usually happens. So we have a gentleman by the name of Mike Lynch. Do you remember who he was? Mike Lynch was a millionaire tech tycoon who fought a battle for many years in the US and actually won. And he was celebrating with his friends. So he had bankers aboard, his legal team, friends and family, and out of nowhere came a wind. Let me explain that, break that down a little bit more. The locals said, with a ship of that size and that architecture, no wind should be able to sink it. I didn't appreciate, because I thought they were out, you know, partying on the high seas. Would you believe this super yacht was anchored at the harbor. Anchored. You would have thought it was safe. I would have. But this wind came from nowhere. So I just want to make this analogy. Christ was in a very similar situation, not just with his disciples, but with a flotilla of smaller ships. There was inevitably going to be the loss of life. But Jesus majestically, and should I give him his proper title, Jesus, the king of all created things, majestically arises from sleep, assesses the situation, and sternly takes action. Can I say this, brothers and sisters, and I, I'm not, not in any way trying to be rude. Sometimes we talk too much. Sometimes action needs to be taken, and we decide to have a board meeting or to confer. Have you seen the pace at which things are happening in the world? And I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. It may well be that you don't read your Bible regularly or do your Sabbath school lesson regularly. Just watch the news. The news confirms what the Bible is telling us. 
And Jesus rebukes the wind and the sea waves and the most unbelievable thing happens. Now, do we have any Marvel aficionados here? I'm talking about the film uh, series, Marvel. Does anybody know who that blonde-headed lady is? Go on, my brother. This brother knows. Storm. Storm, right? Right? And have you ever seen a scene where Storm is dealing with nature and she does this? Come on, guys. You watch the same films as me. Have you ever seen... <laughs> have you ever seen Storm? And what's the actress's name? Haley Berry, yeah? Have you ever seen her sort of do that? And, you know, wow, wow, yeah? Jesus was better than that. Jesus was better than that. He just spoke and the wind died down as, and it grew weary and there was a great calm. Had the story ended there, we could say amen, sing the final song and just go home because that, that, that's just amazing. That doesn't happen every day of the week. But, but bear with me. It would have been amazing, it would have been astounding, it would have been astonishing, it would have been fantastic, it would have been incredible. It would have been stunning, awesome, miraculous, unbelievable, astonishing, if the story had ended there. And I'm tempted to end it there. But let's just dig a little deeper, because I think there are some more nuggets to be found. Tempted though we are to focus on the supernatural demonstration of divinity flashing through humanity, all of this was really just a precursor to the real essence of this incredible story. It was just setting the scene because there were lessons to be learned. Verse 40 says, Jesus said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? King James Version. Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith and confidence in me? Amplified Bible. On an initial reading, and I need you to be frank with me, on an initial reading of these facts, the fact that Jesus rounded on them, has given them a sharp dressing down, has scolded them, quite honestly appears incongruous, absurd, bizarre, strange, odd, inconsistent with the portrayal of the gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Why would he do that? But hold on. Question to our congregation. Why do you think Jesus took that stance? Any answers? Why do you think? I mean, isn't it okay to be afraid? Why do you think? Did you know, just shout, you know. Okay, I like that, but they didn't hear. Can anybody, can anybody help me here? Because I've just come to church for this first time. And I'm amongst Bible scholars. This is how God is. Okay, I'll help you, right? Last quarter, we studied the book off, starts, starts with M. Okay, last quarter, we, start, we studied the book off. Good. Remember participation, remember energy. John the Baptist, in Mark chapter 1, publicly declares, after me comes he who is mightier, more powerful, more noble than I. Is, do we have any young people here? Well, we're all young. We're all young, yeah, okay. Who is your favorite, wait for it, secular, secular performer? I'm talking about music. Who is your favorite secular, shall I start? Shall I start? Stevie Wonder. Whitney? Come on, help me, quickly. Aretha Franklin? Otis Redding? P.J. Morton? Did somebody say Biggie? Michael Jackson? Okay, okay, stop, stop, stop. Because <laughs> pastor's here. The pastor's here, all right? 
<laughs> okay, so, so listen, 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 listen. Shh. Can you imagine any of those artists coming on stage, doing their set, and saying, what follows me? The person who follows me is bigger than me. It's not going to happen, is it? They're, you know, they're going to preserve their space. Yeah? It's very rare for somebody to say, whoever's coming after me is bigger than me. But John the Baptist, and he was a big cheese in his time. He had his own disciples. He had his own church going on. Okay? He says, the person that's coming after me, I am not worthy to stoop down, untie the straps of his sandals, even as a slave. As for me, I baptized you, and you came to me, with water, only water. But he will baptize you who truly repent with the Holy Spirit. It's an altogether different league. All right? Verse 9 uh, of chapter 1. Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan, immediately coming out of the water, as if that wasn't enough. Jesus on upon coming out of the water. What happened? Literally, the presence of God alighted on Jesus in the form of a dove. And as if that wasn't enough, there was a voice confirming, this is my son, in whom I am, I am well pleased. Wow. If only God could say that about me or you. Okay? As if that wasn't enough, immediately... Not after some time. Immediately, the Holy Spirit forced him out into the wilderness, and we know what happens there. And he was attended to by angels. This was no ordinary man. This is God a man. In verse 16, Jesus calls each of his disciples individually, and they're so impressed by him that they leave what they're doing vocationally, and they answer the call to active service. Verse 22, they were completely amazed at his teaching because he was preaching to them as one having God-given authority, not as the scribes. You know my greatest fear as a semi-professional speaker? My greatest fear is that people are not impacted by what I say. Because what's the point? I want you to hear, to understand and by God's grace, act on what I say. Just then, you know, because this, this is a catalog of things that are happening, verse 23, just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out terribly from the depths of his throat, saying, what business do you have with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him, be quiet. Again, the reference to muzzling and telling him to, you know, just, just keep it down. And to come out of this man. The unclean spirit threw the man into convulsions and screeching with a loud voice came out of him. And they were so amazed, they being the disciples, as well as all the other onlookers, right? They were so amazed that they debated and questioned each other saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, parenthesis, demons, and they obey him. Can you begin to see a pattern here? And then, just in case you haven't caught on yet, there was the time when Jesus visited Peter, Simon Peter's mother-in-law, who was lying sick with fever, and immediately they told him about her. Jesus went to her and taking her by the hand. I'm talking about healing through touch. Just took her by the hand, and what happened? Immediately she raised up, and the fever left her. And she says, anyone for dinner? No, no need for convalescence. Now, when the evening came, verse 32, after the sun had set and the Sabbath day had ended in a steady stream, they were bringing to him all who were sick 
and those who were under the power of demons until the whole city had gathered together at the door. And Jesus healed many who were suffering with various diseases and he drove out many demons and would not allow the demons to speak because they knew him and recognized him as the son of God. I put it to you that Jesus was not an ordinary man. And he wasn't hiding it. There were those who, uh, in verse 40, um, it talks about uh, healing with compassion, a leper. The leper left him immediately and he was cleansed. And then there was the man who was paralyzed and his friends, and we all need friends, don't we? You try making it through life without friends. I know some of you don't want people to know your business and blah, blah. Get over it. We know your business. (laughs) We know your business. Your behavior is so strange, you're drawing attention to yourself. Okay? So, his friends, oh, they were destructive. They ripped off somebody else's roof and lowered him down. And Jesus healed. You know, these disciples saw the wonder-working power of God bringing restoration, healing, rebirth, transformation, and hope to people who had all but lost the will to live. Can you see why Jesus was despairing of them. They'd seen all of this. We're reading about it. They saw it. They were in the presence of Jesus. And they still lacked faith. He said, you know, the the question I'm, I'm asking myself, how much more could Jesus have done to convince them, to persuade them that they should have faith and confidence in him? I'm going to suggest something here. And I know most people are worried about money. I know because we're British, we don't talk about money because it's crass. But the reality is most people are worried about money. Right? And I'm telling you, if Jesus walked through those doors and he sorted out everybody's mortgage and everybody's rent and the school fees plus 20%, and he gave you a little something to get on with so you didn't have to work for a year or two, just had time to meditate and think about the next steps. I promise you, within time, most of us, and I'm including myself, would find a reason to complain. How much did he give you? He didn't give me that much. (laughs) So what's wrong with you? I haven't got the same color eyes as you? Yeah? Because we are complaining spirits. We don't know when we've got it good. For those of you who are arguing, fussing, and fighting, Ask yourselves why half the world is trying to make it to these shores. We've got it good. May not feel like it, but we've got it good. And we're going to look back at days like today, and we're going to say those were the good times. So, this is, this is, this is, this is very sad. Verse 41, they were filled with fear. And they said to each other, having seen the demonstration of God's power, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? They just didn't get it. Is it possible? It's a rhetorical question. I'm not asking you to agree or indeed disagree. Is it possible to be a Bible-reading, tithe-paying, church-attending, hymn-singing, atheistic Christian? Is it possible that we go through the rites and rituals of worship, but we don't believe in the power of God? And sadly, I think we know what the answer is. Is it possible to be so close to Jesus, we share a meal with him, we're conversing with him, we are seeing him up close and personal, and we don't recognize him for who he is? Why do you think that might be? Why do you think that might be? There's a relationship issue. And sometimes we come to the table with preconceived ideas. These were people who wanted to take back their control, their liberty by force. They wanted somebody to beat the Romans. So I, I'm always surprised when people go, huh? And you know, you know, when the penny drops, huh? Because what they're really saying is, I didn't think enough of you to believe that you could do that. It's a cuss, but that's the bottom line. You live where? You do what? 
You know who? We're children of God. Head and not the tail. So, pressing on. Is it possible not to fully appreciate the fact that we have nothing to fear when God is in our ship, if we call upon him when the storms of life are raging? Is that possible? You know, fear, fear is many, many things, and we all have fears, but I'm going to share with you the antidote to fear. The antidote to fear is faith. At this point, the church is supposed to say amen, amen. right? Faith. And the reason I say faith is because in Hebrews 11, verse 1, King James Version, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, and we all know it, help me here, the evidence of things not seen. But Ainsley being Ainsley, Ainsley's gone off to the Message Bible, which is a little bit more wordy, but interesting, an interesting take in the Message Bible. You know what the Message Bible says of the same verse? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, faith is the fundamental fact of existence and is trust in God. It's the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It's a handle on what we can't see. The act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors and set them above the crowd. Wow. Wow. The Bible confirms that everybody, and this is key, everybody has a measure of faith. I'm, I'm, I'm being straight with you. Everybody has a measure of faith. But this is where we pivot. The question is, where is your faith? Wordplay in God? Where is your faith? In God? You know, each of us, with our measure of faith, we invest our trust, our belief, our confidence, our faith, in other words, in many things. Some people here are investing their faith in their fierce intellect, their good looks, their physicality, their fashionable wardrobe. Some people here are investing their faith in their partner, in their nuclear family, in their extended family. Oh, now, I just remembered, there are some people here who are so heavily invested that they're investing their faith in their qualifications or their skill, their illustrious career, which they've built up over years and is full of promise. Then there are others who have a network of professional friends. Have you ever heard the saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know? How true is that? Amen. Amen. All right. Okay. Some people invest their faith in the organization that they work for, or with which they are connected. Others have investments, and they invest their faith. You know, I, I know guys just watch the stock market all day long, and then they move. They're like predators. Yeah? Some people invest their faith. <laughs> I hear people over here smiling. I don't do that. I don't do that. <laughs> I am a professional investor, but I don't do that. All right? There are other people who invest their faith in their large bank balance. How many people here, be honest with me, you like just at least 10,000 pounds as a, a cushion, a blanket? You, you need more? Okay, 50,000 pounds would kind of take care of your business? Okay, all right, all right, okay. Um, some people invest their faith in political ide ide ideology. Um, you know, some people are for state control and have been to parts of the world where, you know, you can't do this. You know, they're about collectivism. And if you step out of line, things happen. Bad things happen. Other people and other places in the world believe in the free market and capitalism and individualism. Some people believe in church structures. And I'm thinking about the conference, the pastors, the elders, the deaconry, your fellow members. Are any of these beliefs, and I'm using a business term here, are any of these investments giving us a return that we would expect? No? 
No? Well, allow me to say this, and this is the crux of the, today's presentation. If the truth be told, we are all ex uh, exercising faith, but I'm not too sure that we're all exercising faith in the right thing. Brothers and sisters, boys and girls, if your faith is rooted in anything other than Christ Jesus, in this time in which we are privileged to live, last days, your faith is misplaced. And that, 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 that's strong, but it's true. These are the last days, and everything, says one of my favorite Christian writers, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. You haven't seen anything yet. And I know that there are those who kind of want to rationalize God. Well, let me be plain. You're not smart enough. I'm not smart enough to rationalize God. That's why he's given us eternity to see his thinking. And even then, we won't be able to catch up. Ask me how I make it through. Come on, guys. Ask me how I make it through. Okay, turn with me to Psalm 91. And I'm reading from the Living Bible. And we're going to close on this. This is what the Living Bible says, Psalm 91. We live within the shadow of the Almighty, sheltered by the God who is above all gods. This I declare, that he alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I'm trusting him, for he rescues each of us, you, it says here, from every trap and protects you from the fatal plague. He will shield you with his wings. They will shelter you. His faithful promises are your armor. Now you don't need to be afraid. Let me repeat that for emphasis. Now you don't need to be afraid of the dark anymore, nor fear the dangers of the day, nor dread the plagues of darkness, nor disasters in the morning. Though a thousand fall at my side. Amen. Though a thousand fall at my side, though 10,000 are dying all around me, the evil will not touch me. I will see how the wicked are punished, but I will not share it. For Jehovah is my refuge. I choose the God above all gods to shelter me. How then can evil overtake me or any plague come near? For he ought his angels to protect me wherever I go. They will steady you with their hands to keep you from stumbling against the rocks on the trail. You can safely meet a lion or step on a poisonous snake. Yes, even trample them beneath your feet. For the Lord says... Not Ainsley. The Lord says, because he loves me, I will rescue him. I will make him great because he trusts in my name. When he calls on me, I will answer. I will be with him in trouble and rescue him and honor him. I will satisfy him with a full life and give him my salvation. Let the church say amen.